everybody, welcome back to I Will Be Okay Thursday. For this week's video, I will be using storytelling as a form of counsel. So what I did a couple weeks ago is put out a poll on my Instagram story where I asked people to respond with something that they may be struggling with. And I took those responses and reworded them to respect some anonymity for people and as well kind of renamed them as more of like the root of the issue that they uh, spoke about and found some commonalities between some of them as well. So I said I was gonna pick three, but what I'm actually going to do is, in response to three of the responses, give a story about my life, and in response to one of the responses, give a story not from my own life. I was inspired to make this video uh, because of two things, my friend Nikki requesting to make this video and as well, I just finished reading this book which spoke about rabbis, priests, and monks who back in ancient times would counsel people in their community and they would do so by telling people stories or giving them parables to kind of inspire them or get them through what it is that they're struggling with. I'm so excited to make this video because I think it's a beautiful ancient practice that has in many ways been lost, so I hope that this video is in a way a retrieval of this beautiful practice. So most of the responses I received actually had to do with anxiety pertaining to the pandemic and pertaining to the world that we're living in now and deep-seated fears on are things going to be okay and when will they be okay and will things ever be, you know, what they were in some capacity again. So in response to this, I want to tell you a story from this book called Small Miracles of the Holocaust and the story is titled The Philosopher and so I'm going to read it to you. Viktor Frankl was a young man of spirit and culture a penetrating thinker who had distinguished himself through his innovative ideas. He was a gifted writer, and among his most precious possessions was the manuscript he was working on, a brilliant thesis that elaborated upon his own personal philosophy. The Nazi guard who welcomed him to Auschwitz cared nothing about who he was or what ideas he harbored. They knew that he was a Jew, and thus deserving of the most dehumanizing treatment possible. They stripped him of his clothing and possessions, shaved his head, and reminded him that the term human being was reserved for a particular race, and certainly not for Jews. Although they took so much from him, they could not take his greatest resource, his ability to contemplate, to question, to probe. So as they pushed and kicked at him, as they cursed him and spat at him, he was traveling in another realm. He believed that man should only live a life filled with meaning, with significance and goals. To merely survive, to simply avoid the pitfalls of the camps, he did not consider this to be a life filled with meaning, for that would be mere coincidence and nothing more. True meaning would indicate that the actual experience of suffering through the camps also had a deeper dimension, answers that only a discerning questioner would be able to discover. These were the thoughts in Viktor Frankl's head as the beast took away the physical representation of his philosophy, the manuscript he had been hiding under his shirt. This was his lowest point. His mental child, the product of his toil and determination, was being taken from him. He felt like his life had lost its meaning. It was worthless. He shuffled along in the camp where he was handed a tattered uniform one whose previous owner had long since been led to the place of no return. He donned the striped rags, resigning himself to this new existence, to this nightmarish world without hope, without meaning, and without his precious manuscript. This loss left a gaping void in Viktor Frankl's heart, where he had carried his life's work. Then his fingers felt something. There was a tiny scrape of paper in a pocket, left over from the poor inmate who had worn these clothes before him. He opened up the small paper and tried to make out the words written on it. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkeinu Hashem Echad. I think that's how you say it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. God is one, God is in control. God is leading us to the depths of despair. God is expecting great things from us, wherever we may be. Viktor Frankl had his meaning, 
and he had his manuscript. So there's a few reasons why I chose to share this story and one of those reasons is that I think that sometimes a really helpful practice when we're in a challenging time is to look back on times where things were either worse or just as challenging and see how we continued to make it through. Now, with this story being, you know, a man in the concentration camps, which are, you know, we all know one of the worst places to have been on earth in our history, and comparatively what we're going through right now is kind of nothing compared to what these people went through. I mean, I know not everybody has a lot of money right now and some people are gravely poor and suffering very much at the moment and I don't want to dismiss that in any capacity. However, I would say an overwhelming majority of people right now are snug in their warm homes, surrounded by technology and the ability to watch TV, connect with people over the internet, and order food to your doorstep. So it's kind of a luxurious, challenging time in many ways, and sometimes I think it helps to see it that way in moments. Now I know it doesn't take away the anxiety of, you know, being able to go out and be social again and live our lives and travel and I definitely feel you know that despair in myself as well but I think looking back on challenging times is like okay I'm sure during that time like during World War II like that lasted a long time and I'm sure people had similar thoughts of like is this ever going to end like look at the world like it's literally hell and we made it through and even comparatively, this pandemic compared to the last pandemic is very different. We have advanced medically so much since then that we were able to get a vaccine out this quickly. So I think that there is an end in sight, who knows when, but at least we can kind of see it off in the distance right now. Another important piece from this story is meaning. So he was in a treacherously horrible place and thought to himself like there has to be meaning to this. There has to be some meaning to our suffering right now. And I think that if we're able to find that, if we're able to say like okay this is a crappy time but what can I get out of this? How can I use this situation to grow in some way, shape, or form? Is there something that I can make out of this time? And I think that this story is incredibly inspirational for that. Another kind of hopeful thought I can give you that I've been thinking is through the most challenging times, the most brilliant creative ideas come out of it. And something I've been telling myself is like, I can't even imagine all the creativity that is going to come through once the pandemic is over. And you know, but like, I feel like there's gonna be so much of a response and processing of how the pandemic affected all of us. And I think in that, we're gonna see some incredible art. All right, so the second response that I got from people was one basically about needing to make necessary changes. Um, this person said that they're not happy with where they're living and they're not feeling you know, like they're being rewarded by living in this place and uh, they need to make changes. And so immediately after reading this response, I thought to myself, this is synonymous to my experience when I moved to London initially. So I'm gonna share that story with you. So before I moved to London, I had to find a place to live because I needed to have an address to get a visa and like live in the country. So in terms of doing a house tour, I had people do that on FaceTime. So this one place, it seemed really cool. Like they were like, oh, you know, we're environmentally conscious and we have a cat and you know, we are vegetarian. And I was like, oh nice, okay. I was like, that, that means that maybe they're probably nice people. Like maybe we will actually be a good fit. So they FaceTimed me, they seemed all right. So I was like, okay, like I guess I'll take this one. So when I arrived in London, I remember as soon as I got out of my Uber and walked up to this place, I was like, oh 
my god, I was like, what have I gotten myself into? And I just had this feeling in my stomach that was just like, this is not going to be good. And that feeling was just continuously reaffirmed and living there was atrocious. Like I look back on it and I'm just like, I feel like the whole time I lived there, it was dark. Like the sun never came out. The people, there was a couple people I lived with that were definitely mentally ill, but there was one that was so much more severe and every day she was screaming at someone. It was, it was bad. And so I stayed there for six months and I remember I just kept thinking okay maybe it'll get better or I'll just sit down and have a conversation with her maybe it'll be all right like we'll figure this out we'll figure this out and so I kept being you know overly positive and not just really you know admitting to me like the reality of the situation was I needed to get the fuck out I was so drained I felt like I couldn't fully be myself I had to like, I felt like I had to like hide in my room and I felt like I couldn't be in that space fully. Like I noticed something when I was living there that I didn't realize was something important to me. But if I live in a space and I don't feel like I can sing out loud, uh, that means that you're not in the right place, you know? <laughs> and like, I just... Yes, and I, I didn't sing the entire time I was there, and I was like, something is wrong. Anyway, a point came where I just exploded with rage, got into a massive fight with the one particular roommate, and after that fight, I was like, you know what, I have to get the fuck out of here. And I remember I was so stressed and this roommate would like talk crap about me while like she was in another room but she would do it really loudly so I could hear her. She was telling me I was like a piece of shit person every day. It was horrible. It was literally like abusive. And I was like, I have to get out of here. And I just like kept looking for places to live and I would like stay outside of my house as much as possible. Like I would walk around the city aimlessly, sitting in restaurants, staying at pubs like as long as possible and getting drunk. So I would come home and kind of be numb to the situation. And I would stay on the tube like unnecessarily longer. Like I'd just ride back and forth in places just so I wouldn't be home sometimes. It was really bad, and so I remember keep like continuing to like look for places to live, and I was like finding all these places, and nothing was like really like oh this nothing really suited what I was looking for. And this one day, I like connected with this girl on Facebook, and she was like, oh yeah, I'm subleasing my place. If you want to come check it out, blah blah blah. And I was like, okay, I like look at the photos. I was like, oh, I don't really know if it's yeah if that's really what I want. So anyway, I went there and I remember as soon as she opened the door, it was like I got this feeling of like, oh my gosh, like this feels like home. And we like went into the room and I was like, oh my god, I was like, this is, this is, I was like, I have to live here, I have to live here. I was just so like overwhelmed with this feeling of like peace. And after I left, it was raining and I got on the tube and when I got off of the tube, I was like walking up the stairs and I could see like a double rainbow and I knew that it was a sign like I was like I have to I have to live in this place and it's gonna work out and everything's gonna be okay and it was you know you know how sometimes you think that and things just don't turn out the way you think they do but that was like actually a time where things turned out positively and after that moment I Literally, like once I moved into that new place, it was the literal best time of my entire life so far. I was like the happiest I've ever been. It was the greatest room I ever had in my life. And I'm so glad I finally was like, I have to stand up for myself. I have to stand up for my happiness. I have to stand up for my comfort because that's nobody else's job but yours. And I truly, truly believe that when we stand up for ourselves, when we stand up for our happiness, and we, we go after what it is we really need for ourselves, I truly think that sometimes things in our life will help us and conspire with us to make those things happen. So the third response that I got was about, you know, seeing people we used to love move on and becoming the person that we wanted them to be but that they weren't were, weren't with us. And this person also said that they don't have feelings for them anymore, but they're still feeling hurt 
and I, I totally get that. So kind of how I understood this is basically judging other people's journeys and losing sight of your own. And this reminded me of two of my worst relationships. <laughs> yes, my relationships obviously were not very good, <laughs> which I actually draw on a lot of lessons from them. So again, silver lining in crappy situations. Uh, but so both of them after the breakup were with somebody like almost immediately after. And I remember, well, also they cheated on me with these people as well, so, you know, they were already with them, we were together, but then for one of, yeah, but then I found out that they were like dating these people after me, and I was like, oh, that's great. And, you know, there was a moment where I kind of was like, what the hell? Like, how could you immediately be that for this other person, but you could never be that for me? Like, what was wrong with me, you know what I mean? And I had moments where I would kind of question myself, like I was like, why, like what what was that and why did that person act that way towards me but totally different with them? And it was like interesting because these people also went into serious relationships after me. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm just, we're just dating. It was like, no, like we're together for many years now. <laughs> and something that I realized through processing like that pain I felt was that your healing process is never going to look like someone else's, ever. And to kind of project your own way of healing onto another person isn't really reality. And my healing process was more that I want to be alone. You know, like after I break up with people, I'm not the type of person to ever try and like jump and jump and jump into things. I like to take my time, I like to wait, I like to see, well, how did that person fuck me up? Like, wait a second. I also think that, you know, the, somebody moving on doesn't necessarily have to be that you moved on with another person. You could also move on in other ways. And I think as well, sometimes somebody jumping into a relationship after your relationship could be that that person is running away from like a void within themselves that you filled but now somebody else fills it and also after somebody breaks up with someone and they're immediately in another relationship like is it possible that they're like kind of running away from the pain that they caused you we don't really know what's going on in somebody's relationship except for those two people who know what's really going on and to kind of like judge from the outside like someone's relationship like you don't know like that person might be doing the same crap that they did with you but on social media it looks like a wonderful peachy pie picnic relationship you know when it's really not in reality it's hard to also quantify like is that now that person is who I wanted them to be because you don't know that well, I think sometimes it is true that people will learn through us what they actually want and they'll make mistakes with us and then realize what it is that they're actually looking for and I know that that can be a pretty sad outlook and make you feel like oh well am I not like worth it like am I just teaching everybody some shit and it's like well you know we're all teaching everybody something at some point you know like I think as much as somebody could come into our lives and teach us a lesson we do the same for others whether they talk about it with us or not and I just think that sometimes, you know, people learn through us hurtful things and then the next person benefits from it, and that's okay. You know, sometimes it's just not your turn and it's other people's turn. Another really excellent thing my dad said to me, he said, Tasha, you know, sometimes it's just not, it's not your turn. It's not your turn to be in love. It's not your turn to be in an excellent relationship. It's not your turn to get a job opportunity that you want. Like, the list goes on. And that perspective has honestly helped me. Just sometimes like, hey, it's not my turn. But it doesn't mean it's not somebody else's turn, you know? But looking back on my life now, I'm just like, huh. I'm like, it's so interesting that they immediately jumped to being with another person, whereas I jumped to having new experiences. I jumped to living in so many different cities around the world and if anything, if I have anything to say about myself is that I know that I've been to more places than these dudes can ever dream of and nobody could ever take that away from me.
So the fourth and last response that I wanted to respond to with a story, basically this person was saying that they feel like their own depressive feelings would be a burden on their partner if they express them. So they're basically hiding how they truly feel. So what I wrote in response to this is this is basically like repression and you know not wanting to be a burden so you repress your true feelings about yourself and your situation and in doing so you, you don't allow yourself to be your true self with a person. So I first wanted to point out that this is codependent behavior so it's kind of feeling like somebody else's feelings are more important than your own and you know feeling like that person's well-being has to take precedence over you being able to you know be honest about how it is that you're feeling and I think that that gets in the way of really deeply truly connecting with other people because when we're honest about our feelings with other people like that's literally how we connect to other human beings on a deeper level. And so this reminded me of the beginning of my most horrible relationships. I had two really, no, I had three really, yeah, I had three really, really bad relationships, but I had like one that was like Optima or Reblade, like I don't even know what to call <laughs> Anyway, so in the beginning of this relationship, I remember feeling like I was like, I don't want to be like a nagging girlfriend. I don't want to be a girlfriend that like henpecks her boyfriend and I don't want to be whiny. I just want to be a cool girlfriend. Like I want to be a girlfriend that's like no problem. I don't mind at all. You know like and I remember telling myself that and feeling like I had to stick to that image of how and what kind of girlfriend I wanted to be. And so my partner at the time, he was um, he was horrible to me, and I kept like being like, no, I'm not saying anything. I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna like tell him that I hate that. I'm not gonna tell him that that hurt my feelings. I'm not gonna. I was just like, I'm not. I don't wanna. T I don't wanna nag on him. And as well, he was annoying the shit out of me on so many levels. So anyway, a point came where it all just like built up and then I just exploded in rage several times and we would fight like to the death. Like we would fight like ugly too. And I think a big part of why we fought the way that we did is because I wouldn't let my feelings come out in a natural progression. I would repress them and build them up and then they would like fucking explode all over the place. There came a point in the relationship where I was like, I, I, I have to let go of this image of myself as being this like super cool girlfriend because I'm not being true to myself and I really wasn't and when I finally started you know saying like I don't like that I don't like this it was a process but I'm so glad because I was actually able to connect to an authentic part of myself and realize like yeah these things I don't like and yes this makes me feel this way and that person was not able to connect with me you know once I was authentic about how I felt about things and it was just like a sure sign that I was like this relationship is um, it's not gonna work out and had I continued to lie to myself I wouldn't have I, I guess like penetrated this like deeper dimension of the relationship which was completely and and utterly like baseless like there was nothing truly strong between us that linked us together it was very much based in in things that were really unhealthy and so I feel like now like I find it to be really important for me to express to people that I'm like hey you know right now actually like I'm really sad and I'm depressed or I'm very angry and I'm really upset and being honest about those feelings doesn't mean that they even have to be a burden on the other person but at least there can be like hey you know can we have a conversation about my feelings because I would like for you to know how I feel um, so that you know me more and I think that when we're in like some kind of romantic situation the goal of a romantic relationship I think is achieving greater intimacy with that person on every level you know physical emotional mental spiritual 
I think that there should be a natural progression of knowing the person more and more deeply to the point where you know you're best friends, where you understand each other, where you, you love each other. It doesn't mean that you love everything about them, but it means that the things that you do love about them are so important to you. And I truly also think that when we are honest about being sad and we can talk about it with somebody who cares about us, it can actually help us to like validate those feelings or it can show us that this person is not right for us depending on how they respond to us as well. And that's what I realized in that relationship because I was like, wow, he responded like in a very wrong way and I know that long term that's not what I'm looking for. So I think there's a win-win whenever we're open with people whom we are, you know, in an intimate relationship with. Thank you so much for watching this video on storytelling as a form of counsel. I really hope some of these stories helped you and, you know, it's interesting to kind of look back on the things that we've gone through and struggled with and I think it's amazing to find you know, ways to relay our, our experiences and lessons to other people and I, I feel like making this video has made a lot of, and honestly a lot of my videos on YouTube, like a lot of what I've gone through, it almost feels like worth it because of all of the things I'm able to tell people about my life and, and, and the things that I, I know about life now and you know, I honestly sometimes feel like we go through things so that we can help other people get through things. Does that make sense? So I feel like this video in a way is a, it's kind of a memento to that. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much to all my new subscribers and people who continue to come back and watch my videos every week. It means so much to me. And um, I hope this year has started out fabulously for you and continues to treat you as best as it can. I know things seem, you know, really uncertain, but if there's anything about like Homo sapiens or just like the human race in general, I think one of our most astonishing qualities is our ability to adapt and, and our resilience. And I think it's important to tap into those modes of thinking and being right now because I think that that's what's really going to get us through.